Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Brendan Sexton to the stage. Good morning, how are you? Dry. Uh, I'm Brendan Sexton, uh, and I thank you, Michael, Kita, Dan, for the previous discussion, most of which I could hear and I loved. Um, we're talking now, we'll be talking about New York and transportation and resiliency. The transit system all of us re rely on is already at the breaking point without another hurricane. If you came by way of subway or came through Penn Station, you know that maintenance is desperately needed. <clears throat> but it's not just day-to-day -day maintenance. Um, if you came from either the subway or Penn Station this morning, you may also have noticed that both of those are several stories below the floodplain. And so the issue for us in New York of climate change and rising seas, for instance, are very immediate and very key. Our next group of panelists will discuss new ideas for improving, expanding, and very important, financing our transportation system. We have been experimenting with new modes of transportation like ferries, streetcars, and also new behavioral-based changes like bike sharing, and have been discussing at least congestion pricing. Among these and many other smart ideas, what do we need in New York City and where can we get our new robust resilient system from? What can we learn from other 21st century global cities about the, the challenges facing us, but especially about what to do about them? Please welcome our moderator, Johanna Buya, who is Senior Transportation Editor for Recode. Johanna? settled. My name is Johanna Buya. I'm Recode's Senior Transportation Editor. And today we're going to be talking about how we create transportation systems that stand, whoop, stand the test of time, um, whether that means actually operating effectively over many, many decades, which our systems, I don't know, arguably may be doing, um, or being able to incorporate and keep up with advancing technology. So with me today to discuss this, we have a great panel. It's um, to my left, James Patchett. He's the president and CEO of the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Um, before that, he was the chief of staff to the deputy mayor for housing and economic development, Alicia Glenn. Um, then we have Sarah Kaufman. She is the assistant director for technology programming at the NYU Rudin Center for Transportation. She researches, advocates for, and educates about cutting edge technologies in transportation. And then we have Gabe Klein. He is the co-founder of CityFi, an urban advisory services forum. He's a former commissioner of Chicago and Washington, D.C. Departments of Transportation. He revamped technology platforms and government processes with focus on putting the human experience above the automobile. And then we have Scott Reckler. He is the CEO and chairman of RxR Realty and chairman of the Regional Plan Association. He was recently appointed to the MTA board by government Andrew Governor Andrew Cuomo, and until last year, served on the Port Authority Board of Commissioners. So thank you for joining me. Um, so I want to start by kind of setting the stage a little bit. Uh, you guys each have a very different resume and bring a, a, a variety of experiences to the table. So I want to kind of go down the line and feel free to chime in and, and bounce off each other, but go down the line and identify some of the more pressing transportation solutions each of you are focusing on. Maybe one each, just because we only have 45 minutes. So, go ahead. Well, sure. So, I just very quickly, I would, so I'm the president of the city's Economic Development Corporation, so I'm very focused on economic development, which means our ability to have lots and lots of good jobs in the city. And without a good, effective, functioning transit system, it just becomes harder and far harder for New York City to compete. So from my perspective, it's essential that we have a functioning transit system, which includes all aspects of it, for us to continue to be economically competitive. We're in the middle right now of a 
North America-wide competition for where Amazon is gonna locate its second headquarters. And I know that folks at Amazon back in Seattle are reading the press and reading about this panel and everything else and worried about the future of our transit system just like everyone else. So from my perspective, you know, we're working on a series of individual projects like expanding our ferry system, looking at a new proposal around streetcars, and thinking about the future of you know, other transit opportunities. But I would just say from narrowly from my perspective, it's about securing the transit system as a whole so we can continue to be competitive with players like Amazon and everyone else who's looking for a new home for more jobs for New Yorkers. Just really quickly, where would Amazon be in New York? Uh, that is totally um, <laughs> to be determined. Uh, they, you know, they're looking for development. What's that? Yeah, <laughs> development. They're looking for a headquarters. Uh, they're specifically Scott's building. Uh, they're looking for a headquarters um, anywhere in North America, and they're looking for fifty thousand employees. So they would be our largest private employer if they moved to New York City. Uh, but we're competing against every city in North America, which includes, you know, obviously Canada and Mexico. So it's a very uh, wide open competition at this point. Great, Sarah. Good morning, I'm Sarah Kaufman. I'm out with the NYU Rudin Center for Transportation, as Joanna said. Um, right now, our primary focus is on paratransit, which is how people with disabilities get around the city. This is something that hasn't been addressed, and it's an overly expensive and inefficient and um, bad service for people who use it and for the city and MTA. So right now we're doing a deep dive into the data. Um, we are looking at about six and a half million paratransit trips, finding trends and patterns in activity, especially near um, health centers and non-accessible subway stations, and looking at solutions for these issues. Um, those six and a half million trips are from a single year, so it averages about 17,000 trips per day. Uh, that's a lot of vehicles out on the street, and only about a third of those trips are shared. We're trying to figure out how we can get more right-sized vehicles out on the street, <coughs> getting people around more efficiently, and like every form of transportation, using data and demand to create a more dynamic mobility mode. Um, our other studies have to do with the economic impact of the L train closure. Um, I'm looking at equity in smart city development, and social media in transportation agencies. Um, very quickly on the paratransit end, it, Uber and Lyft are, have, are actually experimenting a lot with providing non-emergency medical transportation. Have you looked at all at the impact of that? Sure, so there are pilots in Boston and DC right now, and a small pilot here in New York using ride-sharing tools to um, get around for paratransit trips because most paratransit users are ambulatory. So. That's, um, that's kind of the, the coming uh, mode to fill in the gaps that we have here, but it's, a, it's very early. Hi, everybody. Uh, Gabe Klein uh, with City5. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, it's an awesome topic. And the things that I think about, I mean, I think about so many things, it's hard to <laughs> narrow it down. But when it comes you to- You have one second, so yeah, hurry. <laughs> right. So, um, I mean, I think about uh, the fact that we overcomplicate things often. We make things really tough. 70% uh, of trips in cities less than a mile are taken by car. So I was walking over here from Penn Station this morning, took the train in. Um, the train, by the way, was going like this the entire way. I couldn't nap. I could barely work on my laptop. I just came back from Sweden and Tokyo, yeah. and nothing. Then, then I like am walking over here, and it's just like whap whap whap, you know, horns everywhere. And I'm just thinking, if we could just, you know, move 10% of these people of, of that 70% uh, onto a bicycle or walking or transit, the streets would feel completely different. So a lot of it, I think, is about figuring out what what's the use case who can provide the service best, creating a sandbox where you allow public and private to work together to do that, learn from it with the data, and then make those larger investments. And unfortunately, we don't experiment too well in this country. We're getting better at it over the last decade. And we, you can tell a lot about a city by how we allocate space and money. And we just don't invest in transportation. And then we wonder why it's falling apart. So these are all things that I think about. Morning, everyone. So I'm going to just give a, a broader perspective for a second, because when I think about what's happening uh, as a city, we're really a victim of our own success, and we're a victim of our own failure. On the success side, we have become a magnet for talent, right? We attract the best and the brightest from around the world. 
And if you look at all of the statistics, whether it's job growth, population growth, tourism, they've all hit new record highs. I've just even put this in perspective uh, in terms of the success. In the last seven years, our population growth has grown to a point that the whole city of Atlanta is the equivalent of the population growth. So that is great news. The problem is it's put tremendous strain on our capacity. Um, you know, that's on affordable housing, our transit capacity, uh, et cetera. And where we've been the victim of failure is for decades, if not generations, we have not reinvested into our infrastructure. And so where today, we're at this in incredible tipping point of having this aging infrastructure that has not had an, any expansion or investment at the same time, it's being overwhelmed with demand and ridership, and to your point. And I mean, you don't even need to, to be in the subways. You can walk the streets and just see the congestion that we have in the streets today. I mean, this from 60th Street down, it's uh, traffic has slowed 20% in the last four years, right? So this is a problem that we're all facing. Um, and I think we're going to have to just be putting, you know, Band-Aid after Band-Aid unless we come up with a, a overall macro plan to solve it. And we saw it this summer with Penn Station when they had to close down 20% of the tracks. And they did, I thought, a good proactive job of, of figuring out how to do it, how to communicate to the customers, um, how to create a, uh, people changing their behaviors. I think we're going to have to take more action like that on every element of our systems, whether it's the subway system, whether it's the gateway tunnel under the, the Hudson River, uh, whether it's thinking about how we get our buses to operate more effectively. I think we gotta think outside the box and be more dramatic and realize that if we don't do this, the great success that we've had as a city uh, is gonna go the other way. And you know, this, this great cycle of progress is gonna reverse itself and people aren't gonna wanna be here because if you can't rely on the, the, the subway or the streets to be able to get to an appointment on time, get home to see your kids, get to uh, your job, uh, all of a sudden that quality of life that has made New York so successful is no longer going to be attractive to other people and they'll go elsewhere. I think James. Yeah, I, would just, I guess I would totally agree with what you said, Scott. I, I actually view our success as a city recently as an opportunity and a way that will make us, I hope, more successful at investing in our transit and our infrastructure than the rest of the country. If you look nationally, the, uh, the association that rates infrastructure, um, which I'm not a member of, but <laughs> A bunch of infrastructure experts, such as they are, uh, rated our national infrastructure system with a D, and we got New York City. We got a C, so we're still terrible. But um, if my I kids just, call me with that one, they would not be happy with my response. Right? No, no. My parents would not be happy if I brought either of those report cards home. But my my point is, it's a national problem. It's right. not a New York City problem, and I think New York is better positioned than the rest of the country because of our fiscal health. Um, as a state and a city to invest in our transit more successfully. But we also need federal government to come and solve the problem at a national level because you know, infrastructure investments historically have been you know, led by the federal government. I think that's a, a critical time. And the other point of slight optimism that I would strike is that you know, in the 1980s, we had a complete crisis of the subways. And that was in the 80s, you know, following up to the fiscal crisis um, in the city as, and, you know, not a time of, you know, success in the economy. And yet from 1980 to 1986, we went from three, or sorry, 30 train derailments on the subway a, a year, 30 derailments in the subway in 1980 to three in 1986. So if, if that was happening in the early 80s, I feel like we can be successful uh, at this time in our prosperity. I just want to go back in and talk a little bit about congestion, which seems to be a, the biggest part of it. And there are a lot of different solutions that uh, um, both private companies and, and governments have proposed. Um, congestion pricing is one of them. I know Uber and Lyft are proponents of it. Singapore is a good example of a place where congestion pricing works really, really well. Um, well, relatively for a Southeast Asian country that is very dense. Uh, so, I mean, what, what, do you, what do you guys think about congestion pricing? Is there a good way to do that that doesn't um, overload taxpayers or people with increased costs of getting in and out of the city? I think the reality is for any bridge that's not paying a toll right now, someone else is paying that toll, right? I mean, it's some taxpayer, some toll driver is paying that toll. So I'm, I'm a big believer in congestion pricing um, as part of a plan, right? And a part of a plan that, that seeks on changing behavior so that during peak hours, we don't have as much congestion in the city because just like surge pricing that we're seeing with Uber and Lyft, people change behavior or they'll pay for it if they want it. 
Uh, and the second is it creates a sustainable uh, revenue stream that we can reinvest into our infrastructure system. And that is the most likely sustainable stream. That's a billion and a half dollars a year of potential revenue stream. But I wouldn't just stop there, right? I think when you think about what's happening uh, with our congestion, you, you also need to think about how things have changed. I mean, deliveries in New York City, dr del delivery trucks are up 30% since 2010. Obviously makes sense. We all shop on Amazon, and so the UPS trucks, the Federal Express trucks. Again, we need to think out of the box. What if we said deliveries uh, in New York City can happen from 10 o'clock at night to 6 in the morning, and there's no tolls? But any other time, there's punitive tolls to create that delivery. And then I think just enforcement. I mean, you know, if you go to cities like London, they use cameras. And so if you can get the cars out of the bus lane, if you can get the cars out of the traffic box when they shouldn't be in the traffic box, or out of the double parking, you know, you take lanes that are roads that are three lanes that are right now are one, that you open up the, the three lanes and you have more capacity uh, out of our existing system. So it, if, I think the business community at large recognizes that we need to do something more dramatic like that uh, to be successful. Um, and not just because of, of just because of the congestion, but also to find the revenue stream to reinvest in our system. Yeah, yeah it's I mean, interesting you mentioned London because in, in order to enter the central part of the city, you actually have to call in and get, get and pay for a permit just to drive through it, which is, I've never heard of that in other parts of the world. I, I also was very appalled by it, but I'm a New Yorker, so I think that's why yeah. <laughs> um, came in. Well, that's, I mean, but that's an example of a stick, right? So we need carrots and sticks. And I think where we have problems is where we introduce sticks into the regulatory scheme with no carrots. And then it appears that we're just trying to raise money, you know, for, for the general fund and things of that nature with, you know, cameras or, and so I think, I, I agree strongly with, with what you said. Like, there are great examples around the world. We could learn in New York from Deventer, which is a tiny little town um, in the Netherlands, uh, where they don't have, they don't even allow bikes in the central core, only people walking. And I went there at 6 a.m. to watch all the delivery trucks, all the beer trucks, you know, all of that unloading 4, 5, 6 a.m. and they have to be out of there. Then you get outside of that core, people can walk and bike. And then you go out to the rural area and there are bike lanes everywhere and people actually bike a fair distance. So it's about doing a whole lot of things, but we've got to introduce different pricing schemes, because we're not paying for uh, our infrastructure. It's been, you know, since 92, we haven't raised the gas tax. And it was never pegged to consumer price index or anything. So, you know, we're just borrowing, or we're not doing it. And people have to get used to, Americans have to get used to the cost of infrastructure and paying for it. But to your point about it being equitable, um, you know, there are ways to do it so that you introduce other options to people, like mass transit over the bridges. Maybe, maybe there are new options, um, and there is no. Uh, congestion fee. But if you want to drive your, you know, Mercedes or whatever it is that day, yes, you are going to pay. And is, is it a little regressive? Yes. And there are probably ways to mitigate that too. Yeah. So discriminate against Mercedes owners. Yeah. <laughs> <Is that what laughs> well, I yeah, I think, from, I mean, I think congestion, there's, I, I, I sort of separate the two issues, frankly. I think congestion is a challenge in our central business district, um, for sure. The, the London congestion pricing approach, I think, improved uh, average speeds from eight miles an hour to 11 miles an hour in London. So, which is great, so it's like 30%, but it's still only 11 miles an hour. So I think we need to be realistic about what's possible with congestion pricing solutions. Um, and That's why you can't do it alone, right? What's that? That's why it's gotta be part of a package. Yeah, yeah part, part of a package, um, or, or what, you know, I think, and separately, you know, I, I think we absolutely need to be realistic about having a permanent a sustainable funding source for our transit and infrastructure. That has to happen, period, because, you know, the reality is of institutions like the, the Transit Authority and, you know, all of our great infrastructure institutions, they're inherently somewhat political, and so there's, there's, there's never the perfect ability to raise revenue to pay for themselves in the way they were originally envisioned. And as long as that's not going to be possible, uh, we have to think more broadly about other ways and just accept that and you know, come up with a permanent solution that will uh, provide funding and actually solve our transit problems. Um, speaking of congestion, transit solutions, and income inequality, um, 
the BQX, which mm -hmm. you're overseeing. Yes. There are actually a few audience questions about the BQX, but um, in terms of congestion, because that was a, a concern of a lot of the opponents of the BQX proposal, is that it would take up street space. And for those of you who don't know, the BQX is the Brooklyn Queens connector, which would connect Astoria to Sunset Park. Yes. Correct? Um, and it's a streetcar, essentially, and it would mm -hmm. take a total of 30 minutes. You can pay it with your Metro card. Um, mm -hmm. and, but uh, there are opponents of the proposal for a variety of reasons, and one of which is it would take up needed uh, street space. Right. And so sure. well, I think argue against that for me. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, look, every, as, as you've learned in New York City, every thing you want to do has proponents and opponents. Yes. Um, I mean, it's impossible, you know, if you... I don't know, you buy your sandwich from the wrong deli, it's going to upset someone. I think the, the, the truth is uh, there are people who are legitimately concerned about traffic impacts of any investment we do. When we shut down our streets to, um, you know, repair them for critical, you know, to fix potholes, people are upset. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that should stop us from um, investing in the future. So my view about the BQX is we have to think about that and any other creative solution we have to not just fix our transit system, but also expand it. You know, we introduced the city's new ferry system this year, which gets to our waterfronts in a way that we were never able to do historically. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing dramatic ridership, and I think the BQX is another example of something that could be like that, which is to you know, connect people in a, you know, from a north-south direction across uh, Brooklyn and Queens in a way that they're not currently connected, um, and also expand our transit system, which is something we have. We've been talking about how screwed up our current transit system is, but as Scott said, you know, we're growing rapidly. We're having development across the city. We have a need for more housing. And you know, one of the biggest costs people endure is transportation costs, either in dollars or time spent traveling. So if you can cut down that cost of traveling, you make housing inherently more affordable. So we just have to be creative about our transit solutions, whether it's ferries or BQX or, you know, yeah, I don't know, but isn't Elon Musk have a rocket tube or something? He's going to fire people to DC. I'm all for it if it gets people, you know, off the streets. But will the BQX contribute to congestion? Well, I, I, again, I mean, if any time you take away a lane of traffic, it uh, leads to vehicles traveling along that particular route being slowed down. But the goal, I mean, the whole goal public policy-wise, Gabe just re referenced it, is get people from driving their cars. It's bad for the environment, it's bad for our uh, central business district, and frankly, in many cases, it's not the fastest way to get there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, we have this balance in the city we have to deal with, which is people want to drive their cars and they should have a right to do that, but from a public policy position, it's not our responsibility to encourage people to take their cars. It's our responsibility to get them out of their cars and onto mass transit in one way or another. We also looked at the BQX through the Rudin Center, um, and what's interesting about that corridor is that just along the Brooklyn-Queens corridor within about um, a quarter mile of the proposed BQX route, we're expecting over 50 million square feet of new office space mm -hmm. within the next decade or so. That's a huge number of people that'll be commuting to and from work, um, and there are also dozens of parks and education institutions um, and also one of the uh, slowest bus routes in Brooklyn and Queens. Mm -hmm. um, so we do need a transportation solution and we are expecting more congestion along that corridor. So it's, um, I applaud the city for looking into a new creative uh, transportation solution. Well, you'll, you'll have more congestion no matter what, right? right? So the question is, do you make an investment in the future? And we have a real problem here. Like if you look at Singapore or Hong Kong or these other places, like, they, they will have a 100-year plan. In fact, I, was, uh, I gave a speech in Germany uh, last year and met the uh, president of the, the Japan East Railway, which carries like 5 million people a day in Tokyo. And he was fascinated because I kept talking about two-year plans and how in the US we need to have two-year plans so that we can actually get things done before you the mayor leaves. You get a job with a two-year plan. <laughs> right, but, but that, that's what I did in, in both cities. I put two two-year plans in place and, and knocked them out. And he said, you know, Gabe, we have a 100-year plan. Like, the plan will outlive me. <laughs> so we were talking, and we were talking about how what we really need in both countries is the 100-year plan and the two-year plans. Mm -hmm. And um, the problem is if you don't, like, we think, oh, we shouldn't have a streetcar. We should have bikes, or we should have the ferry, or we should have whatever. You need all these things. And like in Washington, where I think we have been successful is 
introducing layers and layers and layers and layers of options. And I, we were talking in the green room, like, we have a wonderful bike share program. We've had it for seven years. I put it in back in 2010. It's huge. But when the private sector introduced dockless bikes, we invited every company to come in and test them on the streets. Let's see what works. Let's let the people at the university do data collection. Let's figure out if it's complementary. Can we give people in certain neighborhoods that didn't have dock bike share bike share? So like, um, I guess in a, in a nutshell, um, we need to have the long-term plan, but we need to be willing to move on the short-term plans. And that includes like taking some risks. And maybe the BQE is a risk. I, I'm not saying it's a great project or, or not a great project. I, I don't know a ton about it. But um, I think people just don't want to take risks. And then we're going to be in a bad situation in 50 right. years. So the conversation around bike sharing and the BQX, there, there are similar conversations about um, income inequality. Uh, dockless bike sharing, for instance, can be introduced in parts of the, the city that there wasn't docked bike sharing. It, it essentially can democratize bike sharing in a way that is useful. Um, and the BQX as well, the main premise of it, as you were saying, is you know, connecting people to economic opportunity. And yet, obviously, when you introduce new transit solutions, there is the risk of increasing property value and thus increasing rent and possibly displacing low-income people. Obviously, that's not the intention, but there is that risk. And so how do we navigate um, creating new uh, transit solutions or transportation solutions within neighborhoods that have low-income people that may not be able to you know, afford to live there if there is? Well, I mean, I guess I've, I would say... Anytime you do anything good in a neighborhood, whether it's build a park or build a new school or just clean up the streets, um, it you know ostensibly can increase property values. Mm. But I don't think anyone wants the sanitation department to leave a giant pile of garbage in the middle of their street to keep their rent down. I mean, I, I, I so I guess I, I mean I, I am totally sympathetic to the concerns about this, but it does not mean we cannot or should not invest in our future. We have to invest in our future and think creatively. And we can't leave our neighborhoods you know, as transit deserts just to you know, avoid the, you know, the implications on rent. At the same time, absolutely, we have an affordability crisis in this town. But I also, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's similar to the argument that we shouldn't build more housing because that housing will be the thing that drives up the rents. I totally reject that. Uh, supply and demand. We build more supply, um, you know, rents will go down over time. We build more transit for communities. It might cause uh, rents to go up, but I'll point out, if you're a homeowner in that community, your property value goes up and that's a benefit to you if it goes up. Second, um, it reduces the transit times in those communities, which is an inherent economic value for people who live in those communities. So it's balanced um, and it has to be paired with, you know, thoughtful solutions around affordable housing and other uh, policy tools we can ha we have that can help people in those communities deal with these impacts. But I mean, by no means do I take lightly the concerns of people around you know the wave of gentrification that people are concerned about. But it, I still think it, it it cannot preclude us from investing in the future because then we'll just you know no one will win. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with everything uh, James just said. I mean, the reality is when you're when you're making progress and you're investing in infrastructure. Historically, it's proven time and time again, it enhances community, enhances quality of life, it creates opportunity for people to actually be able to get places where there's higher paying jobs. I think local businesses, whether it's a restaurant or the local store, that can have more people coming into those stores than they had before. So it's, it's, you know, it's key for economic vitality. And uh, I mean, I think that you can't ignore it. Now, the other thing you can do is you can try to use some of that value appreciation to help pay for this infrastructure and for this whole concept a value capture, which I think the city's in a, a uniquely good place to do, uh, particularly on things like the BQX, because they control both the transit and the zoning of the areas around it and the taxes, right? So to the extent you're creating more property value, can that property value go towards um, investing in that infrastructure? We're doing, for example, in uh, Long Island in Glen Cove, which is a, an area that's had some, some significant challenges, a development on the waterfront, a super fun site, uh, as part of that, we floated $130 million of bonds that are fully supported by the future real estate taxes of that project to invest in roads, sewer system, parks, all infrastructure. And so it's not on the city's books, it's not on the county's books, it's not on the project's books, it's being supported solely on the future development. And I think that type of incremental financing and value capture um, is, is gonna be some, a, a big tool for us to try to use as we continue to invest in infrastructure. 
Uh, I'll just say that, you know, also you could do 30% set-asides for, for affordable. We have our first 100% buildings coming online in D.C., 100%, and they're in prime neighborhoods. Um, you know, if you look at how we built white wealth in this country over the last century, it was through home ownership. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we should be doing is getting more people in our cities that are renting now into home ownership. And one of the ways to do that is to stop building senseless parking garages. And, uh, you know, parking, like I'm working with, with a developer right now that's spending $100,000 of space. Um, and the city's making them do it. Not, not here in New York, this is in Washington. So you're, we're creating an affordability crisis by forcing parking on people that they don't want. Um, and we're giving them the wrong incentives, right? So if we switch up some of the, the, the incentives and then we give the incentives to build affordable housing, we suspend taxation on elderly people, for instance, that can't even afford the property taxes on their houses. Like, there's a whole formula to this, and I think there's a laziness in government to really peeling back the onion and dealing with it. Okay, and, so uh, and, and by the way, the developers can make as much or more money not building parking and building more units. Just, um, you asked us for a little bit of conflict beforehand, so yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll I said help. that if you guys fight, I would be all for it. So just, just <laughs> responding to the laziness in government point, I mean, just so you, you understand, um, it, it, I know you're a former uh, government official, so you... Um, Absolutely. Um, I, first of all, I take great pride in um, the, my colleagues in government. I think they work very hard, and I think they're underappreciated, so I think characterizing government as lazy is, is unproductive, but, but, I th but more... No, but, no, no, no. But, no let me just, but that, I, that includes people like me. I'm, no. I'm saying we don't peel the onion back enough. We say, hey, we did this, we did this, that's enough. Yeah. And I think the problem is that we're not, we're not dealing with sacred cows. I mean, the people don't even want parking. But we're building it because the code was written that way 40 years ago. Right, so I just want but to your, poli your policy point, in New York, you may know, we just passed rules to significantly reduce parking requirements um, if you are located within a half a mile of transit and you're building affordable housing. So specifically, the policy points that you were pointing There's out. good stuff happening. Um, and secondly, um, you were suggesting we should require affordable housing. Well, we recently crashed past mandatory inclusionary housing, which requires people to build 25 to 30 percent affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and by the way, those were wildly politically complicated, um, and the complication was the complaints were primarily from the progressive left saying that we were, that by requiring affordable housing, we were going to um, be increasing property values, mm -hmm. um, which... Which, I mean, which is, it's, I think it's, again, it all stems from a very legitimate place, which is people are worried about property values increasing, worried about rents going up, worried about the fact that New York City is a very expensive place to live. But it is surprisingly hard to get things done that make good policy sense. And it was, you know, it was, it was a challenge to get it done. I was working at City Hall at the time, and it was, um, you know, you'd, you'd think that, um, you know, you'd think that requiring affordable housing would be the development community that would be upset mostly, and they were upset. But more upset were the people who were, um, you know, concerned about cost of living, uh, and of course, on the transit, you know, reducing parking requirements, we had a ton of concerned people about, you know, their their street parking and yep. the way that it was going to impact, you know, the, the where the, how well they could park on the streets. Again, all legitimate concerns, but you know, you have to. It's it's harder than it should be to get things done, is what I would say. Well, you, Can I jump in this yeah, battle? Because uh, since we're having a little ch chat here, there, I, I think the public has a right to be skeptical of the gov government functioning effectively. Right? Yeah. And I think that part of the challenge is that government needs to prove, particularly when it comes to large projects and transit projects, that they can actually deliver projects on time and on budget. And one means to do that, and I think there are some examples of it happening, is leveraging the private sector through public-private partnerships. And we did that when I was at the Port Authority uh, with the Gothels Bridge. It was an interesting uh, case study because we started the Gothels Bridge and the Bayonne Bridge at the same time. The Bayonne Bridge was over, excuse me, over a year delayed and over a couple hundred million dollars over budget. The Gothels Bridge came in on time and on budget because we had a private sector partner that took that risk, that had, the, that had an economic incentive to perform, um, and actually had full transparency uh, moving forward. And one of the biggest challenges I think you see if you don't have that private sector is you lose discipline, right? Because it's not necessarily that you're over budget. It's actually, it may not have been the right budget to start with because politics drive the process whereas the private sector is not going to accept that risk without making sure everything is exposed and there's transparency and it's figured out. And because of that, they'll, they'll problem solve, they'll value engineer to make sure they can deliver the project. And, uh, you know, so we've seen the same thing with LaGuardia Airport right now. That's a public-private partnership, two-thirds funded by the private sector. 
And you know, I think that's gonna be another good example of a project that's gonna come in on time and on budget. And if we can have more examples that are good public-private partnerships, it's ways for things like the BQX and other projects to move forward and give the, the, uh, the community comfort that government can handle these larger projects. Yeah. And one of the great things about, I mean, thinking again a lot about this um, in the context of the Amazon bid, because we've been, part of the thing they, they, they said in their request for proposals was, you know, tell us about the history of your city being able to deliver on big projects. And I, well, New York has done a few big projects, right? I mean, we do have the largest mass transit system in the world. We have more stations than any other mass transit system in the, in the world. Um, and we built it first. It was the first, um, you know, major underground railroad system. We, uh, you know, just recently we built the Hudson Yards, um, which was a, it's a huge new development on the west side within, you know, it was like less than 10 years, uh, which is incredible. We just... Um, uh, cut a ribbon on Cornell Technion, which is the new university on Roosevelt Island, which was, I mean, you know, my predecessors um, under the Bloomberg administration and my predecessor at EDC, Seth Pinsky, who were, you know, the, the fathers of this and, and uh, parents of this incredible um, thing, which it was just, it's remarkable to go out and see what, when people really focus on creative solutions, how we can get big things done. And I certainly think this moment to talk about transit is a time for us to think about what are the big things that we can get done. Because, you know, what is, they say, never let a good crisis go to waste. I mean, that's the great thing. I mean, whatever the, the ultimate um, solution is, I believe that there will be a solution for the transit system because people are, people are fed up, right? It was the summer of hell. We all uh, got stuck. I mean, we all got stuck on the train um, at some point this summer. Most, most of us many, many sweaty times. Um, so I think there will, there will be the... Uh, you know, I think there will be the political will to do something, um, and that's what is why we should take a moment to, you know, to not be lazy, but to think creatively and think be forward thinking and not be afraid of the naysayers. Right. So I have to I have to um, interject because there are a lot of audience questions still on the the in, uh, protecting low income families who have already been mm -hmm. displaced, and so they want a lot of people have asked multiple times um, how specifically you know can the city protect low income people who already can't afford to live in the city. Yeah. I'll, I'm happy to take this one. Um, yeah. so, so I think, right, so it's, it's a, it is a huge challenge. I mean, I think the, the, most, the most important tool that we have is our rent stabilization laws. Um, you know, there's more than a million apartments in New York City that are covered by rent stabilization. Uh, the, the mayor um, presided over two years of a rent freeze under rent stabilization, which meant that for there were two consecutive years. It just never happened in the history of rent stabilization. Um, we have an affordable housing program, which is the biggest in the city's history. It's 200,000 units of affordable housing. Um, and we have to invest in all things to make people's lives more expensive, whether that's new, you know, pre-kindergarten for people that's paid for by the paid for by the city, um, you know, new transit options, which are more affordable. And on the, you know, the mayor is, is, is looking for, uh, you know, low-income New Yorkers to have a discounted ride on the MTA. Uh, certainly transit is a big cost of living for people. So, I mean, it's not an easy solution. There's no silver bullet to making the cost of living in New York for people suddenly drop, and I'm not uh, Pollyannish about that. In fact, I'm very aware of it. You see it all of the time, and I hear it from people every day, and it's Total, like it is a very real fear that people have, and it's not just a fear, it's a reality. People's cost of living is going up, their rent is going up. I mean, it's just, it's just the way people are experiencing their lives. So what do we have to do? We have to create more housing, we have to create more benefits for people who live in the, in the or sorry, people who live in the city and make their overall cost of living lower, and we have to create good jobs for people. I mean, those are the things that we can do, and that's, that's our responsibility as government. I'm not gonna say it's an easy solution, um, you know, we are to a degree a victim of our own success, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that, you know, we'll see over time as we invest more and more in affordable housing and we have a mandatory inclusionary housing program which will create over time a bigger and bigger permanent supply of affordable housing that will, um, you know, we'll see the tide turn. I'm just one to add that, you know, I think when you think about affordable housing, I think you have to think about it on the whole spectrum because there's, you know, people that are low income and there's the challenge there and then there's just every young professional that's in New York, there's an affordability crisis. And one solution uh, which ties to transit is thinking more regionally, right? If you think about the amount of people that live in New York City proper, there's about 27,000 people per square mile, very dense. If you expand that out 
50 miles, including New York City, it goes down to 2,700 people per square mile. So if you think about that, that's where there's availability of land, that's where there's opportunity to actually build. So again, example that we're doing in New Rochelle, where we're developing right by the train station, we're able to build housing for young professionals that's 50% of the cost if they were renting in Brooklyn or Long Island City, and only a 30 minute uh, train ride into Grand Central, right? So I think if we think more broadly, and we invest in that transit uh, system and those downtowns that we're blessed with around the New, around New York City, uh, that's a, an important element for us to not lose focus of. It's, you know, New York City can't be successful alone. It's got to think fully regionally. You can't stress the value of transit, um, both outside of the city, but more so within the city. Um, the more access people have to transit, within half a mile, say, the more job opportunities they have. Although transit outside of the city is great, within the city we're seeing um, higher rates of employment and higher income levels for people who have direct access to multiple transportation options. There is a lot of innovation that can be done, and I, I disagree that it's laziness. I think it's actually a reluctance to innovate, um, a reluctance to change how we, get, how we do things. And so if we do things like let lower income people take the commuter rail, like um, Metro North and Long Island Railroad, if we improve our bus system, which is lacking severely, we can actually get people to um, more jobs, higher incomes, and more education opportunities every day. So I'm going to argue about my laziness comment. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not talking about people being physically lazy and wanting to leave the office at 5 o'clock. I'm talking about a mental laziness. I'm talking about a lack of creativity. I'm talking about, by the way, an equal laziness on the part of the private sector. Um, you know, like, if you want to have a successful private sector business, I think you should, it should be focused on a triple bottom line. And I think that's how government inherently operates. And I think one of the problems we have is sometimes a lack of understanding between public and private. And I actually think in New York it's better than a lot of places. And de Blasio has done a great job with the uh, low-income housing but we need to do things that are more radical and more quickly because we're facing an emergency, you know, f on climate, uh, yeah. affordability. So now that we've done all this great work, let's move to a parking maximum. Let's move to zero parking buildings. Let's do shared parking. You know, why should every building have a parking garage requirement when we could share the existing garage that's low utilization that's, you know, two buildings over? Um, because we have, you know, a lot of valuable uh, real estate and 25 to 30 percent of our downtowns, and, and I'm not just talking about New York, I'm talking about the whole country, are devoted to storing machines that aren't going to be utilized in 10 years because we're moving to autonomous vehicles. So these are the types of things I'm talking about, and actually every city's thinking about it, but we got to move faster. Yeah, but I think, I think, listen, I think to follow that point and, and this logic, it, it, it is the fact that we have this legacy way of doing things in institutions, right? We have agencies that are bureaucracies, and I see it at the MTA, I saw it at, at the Port Authority, that they have a series of rules and regulations and work rules and labor agreements and design rules that, you know, each one maybe is a standalone, makes sense, but when you have 100 years of these layers and layers of regulatory environments, it increases the cost and it increases the, it reduces people being innovative and they do things the exact same way. So, you know, it can't cost us in New York to build a mile of subway four times as much as it costs to do it in Paris and Tokyo. I mean, that's a problem. And so, in Paris and Tokyo, they have rules too, but they're approaching it, you know, in a, in a manner that's more innovative and more creative. And I think we have to have that lens of saying we can't do things that we did in the 20th century when we're in the 21st century, whether it's parking or how we build. We need to reinvent how we invest in infrastructure, not just reinvest in our infrastructure. Um, and that's all the time we have, but I do want to ask just on, on climate change, you know, how are we, how are we creating or ensuring that our subway system and our transit solutions um, are able to withstand another Sandy, which we could be getting again in the next 20 years? Um, well, the MTA is working on um, gates uh, so that water does not enter the subway system. You may be aware that the L train, the whole reason for the upcoming 15-month, $500 million closure and reconstruction occurred because salt water entered the tunnel and completely decimated the, the signaling system and other um, wayside infrastructure within that tunnel. Um, to prevent something like that happening again, we need to prevent water from getting in. Uh, we need to reduce our amount of in-tunnel infrastructure with a modern signal system. 
and we need to uh, introduce the idea of kind of living with water, which is something that uh, Michael Kimmelman spoke about earlier, but the idea that we don't need to pump out every single ounce of water that enters the city, but instead we need to funnel it out in a more creative way and apply it to, say, irrigating the parks or developing um, other uses for the water within the city that would absorb the water rather than um, taxing our infrastructure system to pump the water out. So that's, um, that's a major way that MTA is doing it. One thing that we saw um, after Sandy was that people are switching modes. When the subway was down, people started switching modes, and we have about 20 different transportation modes here in the city. And we saw that people are switching to bikes and using bus bridges and sharing rides. And something that happens in New York is that we're highly adaptable. And so New Yorkers can switch modes and, and then endure a kind of major change in our transportation system because we have so many modes. And we can overcome these issues um, as, as, as they come to us as long as we, in the end, still have our subway system operational. Well, great. I went way over, so I really appreciate you guys taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.